Yes, we have. Um, yeah, we we covered Isaiah last week. Um, so we have started off the prophetic books. We are looking at the five major prophetic books right now. And then, of course, we will be moving into the 12 minor prophets as well. So today we will uh, aim to finish Jeremiah and Lamentations uh, because both of them are written by the same person. And um, for Jeremiah, uh, we'll try to look at what happened during the last days uh, before the you know, before Jerusalem was completely destroyed. So we will be looking at the last one or two years and what they went through during that period of time. So Jeremiah, as we know, uh, okay, I, this is something that maybe not everyone would know. Um, you know, if you remember during the uh, kingship of Josiah, the godly king uh, who tries to repair the temple and he tries to restore all of the feasts and festivals which uh, Moses had commanded, during his time, when the uh, repair work is going on in the temple, do you remember one priest who finds a book of the law of Moses? He finds it and he goes and gives it to the king. And then it, the, the scroll is read out in the king's presence. And uh, Josiah realizes that they have not been following most of the things which God had actually originally commanded. And uh, all of that takes place. So the priest who found that scroll his son is Jeremiah. So Jeremiah is uh, the son of a very godly man, Hilkiah. Okay, so Jeremiah is Hilkiah's son. And he lives in the Levite city of Anathoth. So you know, right? I mean, the Levites were given certain sp specific cities in each of the tribes. And uh, so this was one of those Levite cities. And uh, this is basically where Jeremiah grew up. Now, um, Jeremiah was probably one of the most hated prophets, probably one of the uh, prophets who was, um, who was you know, opposed more than anyone else. He went through a lot of persecution because the people looked upon him as if he was a traitor, um, because he was openly telling them, God will bring judgment. God will wipe out the city. You must surrender to the enemy. So they were saying, what kind of a person are you? You're talking against your own people and you're saying, go surrender to the enemy. You know, instead of encouraging us and saying, you know, fight the enemy, the Lord will stand with you. Instead of saying words like that, you are openly saying, go and surrender to the enemy. The sooner you go and surrender to the enemy, the better. Uh, because, uh, you know, uh, Jeremiah is saying, submit to God's punishment. The time for punishment has come, and now you must submit and accept it. So he was hated very much. And uh, it's really sad that Jeremiah does not realize that the people of his own hometown, you know, um, Anathoth, where he has grown up from childhood, Anathoth, where he knows all his neighbors, his relatives, uh, you know, all the, the other priests and their families, that is where he has grown up. And they themselves, uh, conspire and make a plot to murder him. And he's not even aware of it because he trusts them. He thinks that, you know, they're his friends. Uh, he thinks that at least they will stand by him. But um, we learn in Jeremiah chapter 11, verses 18 to 23, that actually they prepare a plot against him. And uh, it's, he says over here in 11, 18 to 23, because the Lord revealed their plot to me, I knew it. And he says in verse 19, I had been like a gentle lamb led to the slaughter. I did not realize that they had plotted against me. So his very own people um, rejected him. So it must have been very painful for him at an emotional level to be cut off by everyone, to be criticized by everyone, uh, to not be appreciated for your sincerity with which you are doing your ministry. That is difficult. That is painful. Because when we are in ministry, we at least expect the people who are in ministry to stand by us. Even if the other, other you know, the world doesn't um, uh, care about us and they point fingers at us. At least we think our co-brothers and sisters would be there to stand by us. But he does not even have that privilege. So you have the, his, uh, the people of his own hometown. And uh, in fact, this is what they say in verse 21. Therefore, this is what the Lord says about the people of Anathoth 
who are threatening to kill you saying do not prophesy in the name of the lord or you will die by our hands now here is a priestly city filled with priests and the priests are saying don't prophesy in the name of the lord rather tell lies you know if we imagine to what state um, the this kingdom has fallen and that is why no wonder god said now is the time for judgment and god was not willing to wait any longer and um, uh, in verse 23 god says not even a remnant will be left to the people of anathoth because i will bring disaster on the people in the year of their punishment so god says because of this plot which they have planned against you because they were actually planning on murdering you and you were not even aware of what was going on therefore i will punish them so god says that he will avenge what has been uh, you know what was planned for jeremiah um, we kind of need to understand the background of what was going on in that last one or two years the situation was extremely tense if you and i were living over there inside jerusalem's walls at that time we would have lived in tension and fear almost every day because you see um, nebuchadnezzar comes uh, he uh, that's his first invasion he comes and invades uh, he removes the person who is on the throne because at that time, you know, after, in fact, Josiah is the last godly king. After him, his son Jehoahaz comes on the throne. Jehoahaz is just there for a little while. And um, then his, yeah, his son comes to the throne. And that son is removed by Nebuchadnezzar. He, the invasion happens. He comes. He, um, uh, you know, he, he removes him from his position. And he instead appoints... Uh, his uncle that is zedekiah he appoints zedekiah on the throne so after the first invasion nebuchadnezzar appoints zedekiah over there and he goes back okay so um so now onwards they are no longer a free people so around the city you have uh, babylonian troops all around the city walls outside with their permission you can come in and go out because you see, basically, your crops, your fields are all outside, right? In the in the, in the outskirts outside. And also, you have connection to all the other you know, towns and cities. So um, uh, only with the permission of the army can you come in and go out. And Jeremiah is encouraging everyone and saying, go and surrender. The enemy is sitting over there. Go and tell them, you know, from, we, have, you know, we have now surrendering to you. We are no longer with our people. We will now be your slaves. So then, you know, they will give, the, give them special provisions. They'll give them extra food and all of that. So Jeremiah is over here inside, encouraging and saying, go and surrender to those uh, troops which are, which are outside. And every day when the city wakes up, it's waking up to the idea that outside their city walls, the enemy is sitting and waiting. And very soon something is going to happen. So there's a lot of uncertainty going on. And now the food supply has reduced because they are controlling what comes into the city, what, what, what goes out of the city. So they are no longer prosperous and happy and wonderful they were as, as they were earlier. And so now at this time, you have all these false prophets giving all these words of encouragement saying, don't worry, God is merciful. Everything is going to be fine. Everything's going to be all right. And here is this one man standing and saying, no, there's going to be complete destruction. And so they look at him and they say, what kind of a man are you? Don't you, don't you even have heart for your people? Look at the words, negative words which are coming out of your mouth. And so he's criticized again and again. And um, Zedekiah comes to um, you know, Jeremiah. He knows that Jeremiah is a true prophet. So in Jeremiah th chapter 37, verse 3, um, what happens is, uh, you know, he, I think the Babylonian troops at that time probably would have increased. You know, they are increasing the number of troops which are planted outside the city walls. And so he comes over there in uh, chapter 37, verse 3, and he says, Please pray to the Lord our God for us. Okay, so he comes and requests for prayer. And then in the meantime, what happens is uh, the king of Egypt, in the Pharaoh, he decides to come and support Judah. So he starts off with his army and starts coming towards uh, Judah. And when the Babylonian troops hear about what's happening, they think, OK, fine, right now we are not in a position to fight against the uh, Pharaoh's army. Let's leave. 
so they temporarily leave and go away and everyone in the city thinks oh what the false prophet said is correct see this man jeremiah he didn't know what he was talking about all nonsense he was saying but on the other hand see the troops have gone away and then this is what jeremiah prophesies and he says um that will be in verses 6 and 7 uh he says you know this is what the lord the god of israel says he says pharaoh's army which has marched out to support you will go back to its own land to egypt then the babylonians will return and attack the city they will capture it and burn it down it's not just saying they're going to capture the city they he say this entire place is going to be wiped out it will be burnt literally with fire so look at the um the strong judgment that he is speaking and the people are very very upset about this and this is what they say in um yeah he, he says in verse 9 he says even if you were to defeat the entire babylonian army that is attacking you and only uh, wounded men were left in their tents they would come out and burn the city down so he's saying judgment is that sure that's definite he says you will not be able to escape from the judgment which is, which is uh, coming so um the babylonian troops temporarily leave and after they leave um jeremiah wants to go to uh, another place for some work which he has regarding some property matters and so in verse 11 and 12 he goes towards the benjamin gate you know the city had many many gates each gate had a name so he goes towards one of the gates and as he's trying to go outside the captain of the guard arrests him and says oh you are also now going over to the babylonian side and he says no i'm not going to the babylonian army at all in fact you know they are um, um, i'm not going over there to to meet them and surrender he says i'm just going about my own work but then the captain of the guard refuses to accept that and he is arrested and put in a prison which they have made specially i mean it was not actually a prison it was supposed to be somebody's house but now they have turned it into a prison in uh, he stayed over there in that dungeon in the basement for a long time where he was locked up and now just like he said the troops come back the babylonians come back and um, the food supply in the city is running short Uh, because they're controlling what you know how much supply comes inside and uh, so jeremiah is not being given food um he's in a very desperate state he's in a almost in a state of dying he's come to that stage and at that point of time um you have um, zedekiah coming back to him that would be in verse 17 and he says uh, is there any word from the lord because the zedekiah is still hoping that god will change his mind and so he says is there any word from the lord and then jeremiah says yes you will be delivered into the hands of the king of babylon and um, then he literally opens his mouth and he begs for his life he that would be in verse 20 he says let me bring my petition before you do not send me back to the house of jonathan the secretary you know where he has been imprisoned he says or i will die there because he's not even getting any food over there is in a very bad condition he literally pleads for his life from this king and then the king says okay fine we'll put you in the court courtyard of the guard um in another place we will lock you up over there at least over there you'll get some food supply so he's shifted over there to another place and he's basically given one loaf of bread per day so his condition is um very bad and uh, he continues to prophesy for the lord he does not give up his loyalty jeremiah 38 um is the prophecy uh, which he gives jeremiah 38 he says this is what the lord says whoever stays in this city will die by the sword famine or plague but whoever goes over to the babylonians will live they will escape with their lives okay so he says they would be given food by the uh, by the army uh, they would uh, be spared so he, now he's actively saying go and surrender and then this is what the officials say to the king 
they say you spared him you spared his life you put him over there in the court uh, courtyard of the guard and now look what prophecies are coming out of his mouth he says he's literally asking the people to go and surrender to the army and this is what they say in verse 4384 they say this man should be put to death he's discouraging the soldiers who are left in the city so you see, if all the all the soldiers you know believe what Jeremiah is saying and they obediently go and surrender, Zedekiah will not have an army left. So they say, you know, this what you're doing is dangerous by allowing this man to go on prophesying because he's prophesying against us and is discouraging the people from fighting for the city. He's telling go and surrender, and so they say you should kill him. Uh, they say this man is not seeking the good of these people but their ruin. And then Zedekiah changes his mind again and he says, he is in your hands, you know, you know, do whatever you want with him is basically what he says. So now they take Jeremiah and they put him in a well, which is there in the courtyard of the guard. They put him into a deep well. There is no water in it, but it is filled with mud and slush at the bottom. So it, it, it says that he literally sinks into the mud. So maybe up to waist level, you know, he literally sinks into the mud. So that's basically where he has to sit. That's basically where he has to sleep. That's his life. I mean, imagine what this man went through for the ministry that was given to him. You know, we complain about the problems we have in ministry. Ah, it's nothing compared to what this man went through. So he literally sits over there in that pit. And I think they, you know, they they lower down a little bit of water and maybe a little bit of food for him, you know, once in a while. So he's surviving over there. And then it says in verse 7 that Ebed Melek, a Kushite official who belongs to the king, when he hears about what has happened, he takes pity and he goes to the king and he says, yeah, this is what he says in nine, verse 9. He says, Lord, what they are doing, you know, he says to the king, my lord, the king, what they are doing is not correct. So he says, they, are, they, they have thrown him into a cistern. Cistern basically means pit. Uh, they've thrown him into a cistern where he will starve to death when there is no longer any bread in the city. So then again, the king changes his mind. And now the king says, okay, fine, take 30 men from here and go and lift him up out of there so that at least he can look after himself, you know, in case the uh, enemy comes and finishes off. So they they remove him from the pit once again. And he once again starts living in the courtyard of the um, guard. So now uh, again, King Zedekiah comes to him and he says, tell me, is there any word from the Lord? Even now Zedekiah is ripped using to believe the word of God, which has been very, very plainly told. He's going on asking again and again from a word for a word from the Lord. And what is Jeremiah doing every day? He is giving the word of the Lord very plainly, very openly. But Zedekiah wants to hear a different word from the Lord. So again, he comes and he asks. And now over here, uh, you know, uh, Jeremiah says, if I give you an answer, will you not kill me? You know, so then uh, Zedekiah says, no, 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 I'll not kill you. Tell me plainly what is God saying? And these are the very plain <laughs> words which Jeremiah speaks uh, in um, verse 17. He says, if you surrender to the officers of the king of Babylon, your life will be spared and the city will not be burned down. You and your family will live. But if you refuse, he says in verse 18, they will burn it down. You yourself will not escape from them. And then Zedekiah says, how on earth can I go and surrender to the Babylonian army? Because you see, when a lot of people were, were surrendering, you know, they listened to your words, they listened to the prophecy, and they went and surrendered to the Babylonian army. When that was going on, I criticized them. I condemned them. Now, if I myself go and join them, what will their reaction be? They'll be like, ha, huh, yeah, that day you spoke so much against us and you criticized us and condemned us. Now, here, here you are joining us and, you know, surrendering. How can I do that? So, which is what he says. He says, I'm afraid of the Jews who have gone over to the Babylonians for the, uh, for the Babylonians may hand me over to them and they will mistreat me. And then Jeremiah gives an assurance in verse 20. He says, they will not hand you over. Obey the Lord by doing what I tell you. Then it will go well with you and your life will be spared. Even now, in the final hours of judgment, this man, Zedekiah, is being given opportunity after opportunity to obey God and change his ways. But Zedekiah chooses not to do that. 
and so finally we come to chapter 52 where the final events happen um zedekiah tries to make an alliance with egypt and when nebuchadnezzar gets to know about it he's like really angry he says i've given them two chances already and these people are simply not listening to you know what is being told to them and so he comes for the final attack he comes with his entire army they completely surround the city and now no more going in and going out completely sealed off the entire city is sealed off which means no food su supply is going to come inside anymore they do have water sources inside so they'll continue to have water but no food is going to come anymore into the city and so for four months and nine days after four months and nine days there's almost nothing left no food left and um, we see the horrible thing uh, mentioned in lamentations that people actually ate their children women killed their children and ate them um i don't know how anyone could possibly do that maybe they would just get demon possessed or something I mean, anyone in their sane mind i don't think can do such a thing so maybe it's the maybe they were so controlled by demonic forces that they could no longer think straight is all i'm you know maybe so all these horrible things are going on in the city and zedekiah thinks okay we can't just sit over here any longer we need to get out of this place so one night they make a plan they break down one particular portion of the wall and the entire army just rushes out uh, you know through that gap uh, because maybe the babylonian soldiers are less on that particular side of the city i mean i don't know so they quickly go out their idea is to go into the desert and then you know go and seek shelter somewhere but it says in uh, chapter 52 um that they are captured it says in verse uh, 9 all his soldiers were separated from him and scattered and he was captured and then in verse 10 it says that in front of him his uh, sons are killed and the officials are all killed and then he himself is blinded they poke his eyes out and he's now blind and is dragged away to babylon and what did the lord say the lord said if you listen to me your life will be spared the city will not be burnt even then he could have changed his ways but he chooses not to and he pays the price for it a very horrible thing you know watching your own sons killed in front of your eyes um <coughs> that is what he is subjected to so uh, these are some of the terrible things that we see in the book of jeremiah uh, so uh, jeremiah does not speak hope he does not speak restoration he speaks what god has finally decided and uh, he says submit to the lord's judgment and then your life will be spared so those who actually listened to uh, to jeremiah those who went and surrendered themselves they lived they were taken off to babylon they built houses over there they lived you see even these people's lives could have been spared if they had chosen to submit to the lord but they choose not to do that um so very quickly moving on to lamentations um, Lamentations is the book where Jeremiah weeps over the city, weeps over what has happened, weeps over the destruction and suffering which has come upon the city. Now, if it was me in Jeremiah's place, I would probably say, ah, see, nobody believed me. I went on prophesying, nobody believed me. They only criticized me. Now, finally, it happened. Good, good. It's very good that it's happened. But that was not his attitude. The man sits down and weeps and cries because his heart is really for that city. His heart was really for those people. Look at that attitude. There's no desire for vengeance. There's no desire, uh, you know, there's no grudge. There's no hatred. He cries for the people who literally, you know, used to spit on him and criticize him. And he weeps for the city. And that is what Lamentations is all about he writes out five poems five laments to mourn the city you know in their culture when someone would pass away um they would compose a poem uh you know to uh to to weep over that person so in the same way people weep over a person a family member now uh jeremiah writes a lament not to a dead person but to a dead city so he literally composes a series of poems to lament the city, to mourn over the city and express his pain and grief about what has happened. So in, in, in that sense, he's honoring the city, which has 
fallen. The same way you would know, honor a, a, a dead family member by composing a poem to them, uh, like they would do in those days. He, instead of doing it for a family member, he's doing it for the, uh, for the city of Jerusalem. And so you have these five lament poems, which are contained in Lamentations. And it's quite painful if you really sit and read through it. You can, um, you can literally hear the pain in the words, uh, the grief that he is feeling. Um, you know, because he would have been thinking in his mind, if only these people had listened and repented, then all of this would not have happened. But the people stubbornly choose not to repent. They make a choice not to submit to the Lord. So, you know, it's they, basically their fault. Uh, but still, he grieves over them. And uh, there's, you know, some of the commentaries point out the connection between what Jeremiah did and later on what Jesus did. Because both of them weep over Jerusalem. Jeremiah is weeping over Jerusalem after the destruction happens. Uh, you know, he looks at the ruined city and he weeps over it. Jesus uh, weeps for the city before the ruin happens. Because, um, you know, if you go to Luke chapter 19, verses 41 to 44, it says over there that as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. And this is what he says in verse 45. He says, the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. And then uh, he goes on to say, they will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. That has been the problem with the people all along. 60, uh, you know, um, um, I mean, many, many years earlier, the same thing happened about 600 years before. When Jeremiah was again and again crying out, God was coming to them and saying, I am willing to, uh, you know, accept your repentance. But they, you know, they, they failed to recognize that God's coming to them. And the same thing is happening again over here in Jesus' time, where the people are refusing to repent and turn to Jesus and accept him as Messiah. And so he says, you know, you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. And so um, this city will be destroyed. So you have both Jeremiah and Jesus lamenting over the city. And that should give us an idea of the heart with which Jeremiah wrote this book of Lamentations. The same kind of grief which Jesus felt for the city, Jeremiah also felt for the city when he wrote the book of Lamentations. So it's not just a lightweight bunch of songs written just for the formality of writing, but something that he literally felt from the bottom of his heart. And so he was inspired to write these things because in a way, God himself was weeping over the city through Jeremiah. Because you see, these are all poems which have been inspired by the Holy Spirit. So God never actually wanted to bring about the destruction. But it's something that he had to do because the people just refused to accept the forgiveness which he was offering. They refused the redemption which he was offering. It's their fault. But God weeps over the city through Jeremiah. And so these poems are written out under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, who is weeping over the city. And um, in chapters 1, 2, and 4 in the book of Lamentations, uh, you have 22 verses each. And you know, the Hebrew alphabet has got 22 alphabets. So each verse begins with one alphabet. Okay, so they're acrostic. Oh, they're acrostic laments. That would be chapter 1, 2, and 4. Four. Chapter 3 is also acrostic, but that has got 66 verses, which means every three verses, one new alphabet will begin. Okay, so all 1, 2, um, 3, and 4 are all acrostic. Uh, but yeah, chapter 5 is written in a, in a different format. Um, so the main key message of Lamentations is seen in chapter 3, verses 22 to 33. It's a little bit of a lengthy passage, but that contains, you know, in the middle of all the lamenting and the grieving and the expressing of pain, which he is doing right there in the middle of all of that, you have this passage where, you know, Jeremiah says, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. 
great is your faithfulness you know very very popular verse which we all you know use in our in our devotions in our sermons and all of that but look at the context in which these words were written it says over here you know even though the lord was angry even though he judged even though the sin of jerusalem was very very great in spite of all of that his compassions never fail they are new every morning great is your faithfulness and so he says in the next few verses he says you know it is good for us to wait on the lord it is good for us to submit to what has happened and say okay lord your will was done and we accept it you know which is why he says in verse 27 he says it is good for a man to bear the yoke while he is young let him sit alone in silence for the lord has laid it on him let him bury his face in the dust they may yet be hope so rather than you know rebelling against god and saying lord how could you do this what kind of a god are you and speaking a lot of foolishness rather than doing that he says the sensible thing would be now to put your face in the dust and accept what has happened and admit that it was your fault which you know led to this you know this disaster and so he says in uh, the next verse in verse 30 let him offer his cheek to the one who would strike him and let him be filled with disgrace why because no one is cast off by the lord forever though he brings grief he will show compassion so great is his unfailing love for he does not willingly bring affliction or grief on any one he is not a god who wants to bring grief or affliction upon any one he only does that when when uh, we refuse to repent from our side so he says humble yourselves he says you know submit to what the lord has done and in his time the lord will uh, you know restore us now uh, over here in the book of jeremiah in chapter 3 itself verses 52 to 58 jeremiah talks a little bit about what he went through when he was in that pit when he was thrown down over there you know and he was literally sitting in that mud day and night he talks about that and he says in verses uh, in chapter 3 52 to 58 he says they tried to end my life in a pit and threw stones at me so while he was there at the bottom of the pit helpless they actually stoned him they actually threw stones at him and then he says you know i called on your name lord from the depths of the pit and he says do not close your ears to my cry for relief is what he cried out and and he says you came near when i called you and you said do not fear you lord took up my case you redeemed my life so he talks a little bit about what he personally went through in the pit uh, when they had thrown him over there so um let's just look i mean maybe i can just give you the structure of the book of lamentations um in chapter 1 it mainly talks about the destruction of jerusalem in chapter 2 uh, it the main emphasis is on the anger of the lord in the third chapter is where you have the cry for mercy you know this a prayer for mercy and in chapter 4 you have a description of how jerusalem was sieged um, you know how it was attacked all of those details are given in chapter 4 and then finally chapter 5 talks about uh you know in, in chapter 5 he it's a prayer asking god to restore them asking god to forgive them so um this is the basic structure which we find and um may similarity that we see between jeremiah and lamentations in the kind of wording that is used both in uh, jeremiah and lamentations you have the term daughter of zion being used so again and again jerusalem is described like as if she is a person and she is described as the daughter of zion both in lamentations and in jeremiah and uh, also in jeremiah and in lamentations in both the books um, you know uh, the author talks about how his tears were flowing like streams of water okay, so you have that similarity also uh, in both the books uh, the the sin of jerusalem is 
referred to like as if it is spiritual adultery. And so in both of these books, it talks about uh, this daughter of Zion who has chosen to go into adultery. And it talks about how the filthiness, the sin is clinging to her skirts. So you have that description in Lamentations uh, chapter 1, verse 9. Again, in Jeremiah 13, 22 also, it talks about how there are her the filthiness of her sin is clinging to her skirts in the sense it's talking about the spiritual adultery that she has indulged in by going after all those idols and not submitting to the Lord. So um, these are some of the similarities we find between the two books. Um, all right. Yeah. Uh, now coming to some, uh, you know, some things that we can, some details that we can look at in the book of lamentations some particular passages that i thought we could just quickly um, reflect upon so if you look in chapter one if you look in chapter one uh, that is where you have um, you know jerusalem being described as a person i'm not able to find my limitations where is my limitations i know it has to be after jeremiah where else could it be <laughs> okay yeah okay so she's described as a person and uh, you know she uh, if you look in verse 1 it talks about how uh, the deep loneliness the entire chapter 1 uh, emphasizes the great isolation you see everyone has ad abandoned her Egypt also has abandoned earlier Egypt was talking about how they want to make an alliance and partnership and all but now even Egypt has abandoned and so it talks about the deep isolation that she is experiencing it says how lonely sits the city that once was full of people how like a widow she has become she that was great among the nations so now the you know there's nothing left and so in verse 2 it talks about how everyone has abandoned her and uh, uh, her friends have dealt treacherously with her and uh, so it, it begins with a description of what has happened to her. And then it talks about what she is feeling as a nation. Um, that would be maybe in verses uh, 8, 9. You know, uh, it, the descriptions are very, very pathetic. It's like very sad to see the descriptions that are given over there. In verse 8, it says, uh, Jerusalem sinned grievously. So she has become a mockery. All who honored her despise her, for they have seen her nakedness. She herself groans and turns her face away. You know, they're all mocking Jerusalem and saying, huh, the city used to, you, you, you know, it used to say, you know, uh, God's temple is over here, so nothing will ever touch the city, is what they were boasting and saying. Now look at them. Uh, so people are mocking and uh, it says here, she herself groans and turns her face away because she has no answer to give them. So when they're mocking her, you know, she's sh shamed and she just turns her face away. So we see the humiliation that has come upon her. And then um, it says in the next verse, her uncleanness was in her skirts. She took no thought of her future. Her downfall was appalling. If she Jerusalem had thought about its future, none of this would have happened. You see, they were so busy uh, enjoying their current sins, their current idol worship and immorality. They didn't bother thinking about what the future holds. And that is an important lesson for all of us, you know, um, especially people who are kind of very weak in their willpower. They just live for the moment. You know, if, if they just want to go ahead and disobey the Lord regarding something, they'll, say, they'll just go ahead and do it. They're so casual about it. The thing is, they don't think about their future. Because what you sow, you will reap. And they forget about that. So here it says, Jerusalem came to the state because she took no thought of her future. On the other hand, if she had considered her future, then, you know, these things could have been uh, avoided. So that, that's just one description. And um, then when we come to chapter 2, which talks mainly about the anger of the Lord, you know, um, very strong wordings are used over there. Um, yeah, the verse that I was looking for. Yeah. 
you know, in verse uh, 3 and 4, you know, it says, He has cut down in fierce anger all the might of Israel. He has withdrawn his right hand from them in the face of the enemy. He has burned like a flaming fire in Jacob, consuming all around. And in the next verse, it says, He has bent his bow like an enemy with his right hand set like a foe. You know, if you look throughout the Old Testament, the right arm of the Lord, you know, that's the, that's the metaphor which they used in those days. Your right arm is supposed to be your arm of strength. So it always talks about how the right hand of God is with Israel. And here, that same right hand in two verses, you know, verse 3 and 4, how this right hand is now turned against them. That right hand which defended them, that right hand which was always there to protect them and give them victory, that right hand has now become the hand of an enemy. God himself has turned against them. And uh, so we see over here that God uses his right hand, you know, symbolically, of course, to bend his bow and throw the arrows at Jerusalem. Okay, so uh, the uh, chapter 2 mainly talks about the anger of the Lord. And of course, in chapter 3, there is a, you know, the, uh, Jeremiah cries out for mercy and he makes that grand declaration that, you know, great is his faithfulness. So every morning, his mercies are new, even though he has, you know, been angry. So we have those words of promise in chapter 3. And um, then, of course, in chapter 4, you have a description of some of the things which happened uh, to Jerusalem. Um, and that is basically where uh, it talks about you know the women eating their children. That would be Lamentations chapter 4, verse 10. The hands of compassionate women have boiled their own children. They became their food in the destruction of my people. So uh, there's a description of all the things which happened to Jerusalem in chapter 4. And finally, in chapter 5, there is a cry to the Lord, a prayer saying, Lord, you know, you restore us. And when your time comes, you know, in your time, restore us. So over here in verse 20, it says, um, why have you forgotten us completely? Why have you forsaken us these many days? Restore us to yourself, O Lord, that we may be restored. Renew our days as of old. Okay, so this basically is a brief summary of uh, the book of Lamentations. Okay, so these are, these are the main things that I just wanted us to look at from this book. Uh, now, anyone has got any doubts, any questions, any comments? Otherwise, we'll just close with a word of prayer. No. I think the class is too distressed by what happened. They're still <laughs> recovering from the trauma of the experience. You know, we talk about how the COVID uh, and crisis was a great traumatic experience. And you have a lot of articles talking about the, um, you know, the, what the, the, the emotional uh, scars which people are bearing. In those days, they had much, much more severe trauma, much more severe emotional uh, turmoil, where you, where an entire army would come against you and, you know, literally seal you inside the city. You can't even get food. So I think the trauma that they went through in those days was much greater, much higher. So yeah, if we can close with a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you so much for uh, the hard lessons which are there in Jeremiah and Lamentations. In these two books, O oh Lord, we see the anger and holiness of God. Because, O oh Lord, we, we go on focusing on verses which talk about mercy and compassion. We tend to forget that you are an extremely holy God. You cannot just be taken lightly. We cannot just continue playing with your holiness and disregard it forever and ever. A time will come when, Lord, we would have to give account for our acts. So, Lord, we pray that we would live in awareness of who you are. Let us not be like Jerusalem, O Lord, which refused to regard its future. It did not give any thought what would happen to its future. It took your holiness lightly. And I pray that we would not make that mistake, O Lord. Rather, help us to be like um, uh, persons who are advised in lamentations to, to bow down their head in the dust and wait upon you 
and choose to accept correction so that one day they can be restored i pray o oh lord that our attitude would be one of repentance and submission rather than rebellion o oh lord thank you lord in jesus name amen thank you so much for all of you concentrating and yeah thanks for those of you who are online